So tonight we're going to be discussing free will. Fact or fiction? Now, free will is a very philosophical topic. It's a very complex topic. There's a classic joke. I may have even told it to you guys before. It's a boy, about a boy who's going his first time on his first date. And he's really unsure of himself. And he asks his father, Dad, can you give me some advice? Like, what am I supposed to talk with her about? So the father looks at his son. When you go out on your first date, you got to engage her in conversation. So well, what, what, what do I... Well, you could start by talking about things that she likes, ask her about what she likes, then maybe ask her about her family, and then as the night progresses, whatever, you can talk to her, maybe some philosophical topics, some, something that's going to stimulate conversation. So the boy is, okay, he's practicing, he's ready. He comes, he's at his date, and he asks her, you know, so, uh, do you, do you like chocolate? And she says, no. So he's like, okay, uh, well, uh, do you have uh, a brother? Do you have a brother? And she says, no. He says, ah, oh, okay. If you had a brother, would he like chocolate? <laughs> the existence of free will and its exact nature and definition have long been debated in philosophy. The principle of free will has religious, ethical, and even scientific implications. In the realm of religion, it implies that a person's free choice can coexist with an omnipotent God. In the realm of ethics, it stresses whether an individual can be liable for the things that they do. The scientific theory of determinism has been something that the scientific community has fallen in love with, have a love affair with, for many years. It posits that everything in the universe, including human behavior, is predetermined by nature. We're all like pre-programmed robots. What's the allure of determinism? If everything is based on cause and effect and everything is predetermined already, so I'm not responsible for the things that I do. So an attorney's best friend, uh, he's a victim of circumstance. That's how he was born. That's, what, that's the circumstances that took place in his life. A person will never feel guilty or faulted about the things that they do. It has a lot of allure, it has a lot of drive towards it. The truth of the matter is, in the 20th century, with the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty and later the, the development of quantum theory, the idea of strict determinism, that everything is predestined and already laid out, is a thing of the past. So since the belief in free will, or the denial of free will, will greatly affect not only one's behavior, but one's general life outlook, it's very important for us to discuss what is the Jewish approach to free will. In order to do that, in order to get a proper understanding of free will, we have to take a step back. We have to ask ourselves one of the most fundamental questions in all of Judaism. Why did God create the world? What's the whole purpose of this place? So, first things first, God is not lacking anything. He didn't need to create the world. Need implies that there's something lacking. I need something because I'm lacking in something. So it evidently wasn't that because God is complete without us. There, is no, there was no inner need. So the sages describe it as an act of total altruism and love. Just totally the quintessence of benevolence. In fact, the way that the sages describe it is teva hatoiv lahetiv. 
the nature of good, God is the quintessence of good, the nature of good is to do good. The nature of benevolence, the quintessence of benevolence, is to be benevolent, is to bestow goodness upon something else. That's the nature. So he created the world in order to bestow his presence, in order to bestow himself on his handiwork. Being that God is the quintessence of good and all that is positive, the greatest thing that he can bestow, the greatest good that he can bestow is himself. The experience of him. This is something in Judaism that we... The experience of God will take place in the world to come. When a person passes away, and even greater, when Mashiach comes, when the whole crux of everything that the world is looking for, the whole pinnacle of, the, of what we're trying to achieve, ha will have been completed. So for something to be appreciated, or even apprehended, you have to have a contrast. For example, let's say you have a bright flashlight shining at a building in broad daylight. You ever have a flashlight and shine it during the day? You can't really notice it. It doesn't really have any existence because it's so bright outside that the light is unnoticeable. However, as it gets darker outside, what happens? What happens? The light shines. But nothing has changed in the, essence, in the flashlight itself. Just it becomes more apprehendable once it gets darker. Because there's more contrast now, there's something to contrast with, the, the initial thing becomes more able to be experienced and appreciated. So the darker it gets, the more you appreciate the light, the more you can, can feel and experience the light. So the greater the contrast, the more the end experience. Therefore, in order for mankind, in order for God's handiwork to experience the benefit of his presence, he had to make the greatest contrast of all. We first have to experience his absence. What is it like to be absent of God? To make the greatest contrast, which would make the greatest experience, he created a universe, a world, where he is completely undetectable. Mankind is the crux, the pinnacle of creation. Man was therefore created as a creature capable, ultimately, of comprehending and experiencing God. We are what the whole purpose of creation is all about. Everything else is more or less a backdrop. It's the sage that's set for us to do what God's initial plan was. So simply put, the purpose of Hashem, of God's creating the world, was to allow himself to be experienced by a creature far removed and infinitely less than himself. That he should be able to be experienced. Not just be God, but to be God who can bestow his goodness, his greatness, his godliness to uh, his handiwork. Once this is complete, once this handiwork apprehends God, can, 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 can fathom the idea, once godliness is experienced, that will achieve his goal. That's when we say, you ever hear, we say the word, a dwelling place, we, the, our goal in the world is to make the world into a dwelling place for God. That even in the place that was created to be absent of God, even in the place that was created to be obscuring of God, that even such a place should apprehend and experience God. It's the ultimate contrast, and this is what we're trying to achieve. That's when we say the world was created and what we're looking for, what we're trying to achieve, is to make a dir betachtoinim, Mashiach coming, dir betachtoinim, a dwelling place in the lower worlds, that even a place, a physical world, a place that's constructed specifically to hide God, it itself will reveal God. So everything in the world is a means to experience God. 
The whole purpose that he created us and the universe itself was in order for him to be eventually experienced. It's through our actions that we are able to one day experience him. So everything being the backdrop of creation is a means to connect and experience him. Some things through interacting with them and some things through abstaining from them. Even the way in which God would bestow this goodness, would bestow an experience of himself, would, that also he wanted to be done in the best way. He created the human being with the psyche to appreciate working hard, to appreciate the idea of accomplishment, that we should want to accomplish something. That the way in which a person experiences God through earning it, is infinitely better than getting it as a freebie. Think about the way in which we uh, were to receive money. If a person earns $100, if a person receives $100, you feel better about the money that you receive through earning it, through your toil, through your sweat, than just getting a handout. Thank you. It's a basic tenet of the Torah that good deeds are rewarded, and things that are not good deeds are punished. Neither of those would make sense if a person didn't have the ability to choose what they were doing, if a person was just subject to whatever lot they were given. The greatest possible good that God can give is himself. And not only that, not only give of himself, allow himself to be experienced, but also give someone the ability to resemble him. It says that a human being is what's called Itzalem Aleikim, made in the image of God. What does that mean? God doesn't have a form. God doesn't have a nose. What does it mean that we're made in God's image? Being made in God's image refers specifically to our freedom of choice. Just as God acts as a free being without restraint, so does mankind. Everything else in the universe besides mankind is under the regulations of nature. Everything is bound by cause and effect except for human beings. So the world is created as a backdrop for the ultimate purpose, which is mankind. That we should have the ability to choose right and wrong. That godliness should be revealed in a God should, godliness should be revealed in the world in a way that it comes from us choosing to do the right thing. In order for free choice to exist, good and evil have to exist, and they have to exist almost in a balanced way. If every time a person did the right thing, lollipop sh showered down from the sky on them, or if every time someone did the wrong thing, a lightning bolt struck them, there would be no such thing as free will. That's one of the reasons why sometimes you see good things happening to people who don't seem to be such good people and bad things happen to people who turn to, who seem to be good people. That's part of our free choice. That's part of what keeps free choice free. So the good are not rewarded in this world and the evil are not punished in this world. The greater the challenge, the more satisfaction a person has from overcoming it. This is one of the reasons why God made an extremely challenging world. Because we feel a greater accomplishment in achieving, doing what we're supposed to be doing. God created a world in which it would be the greatest challenge. It goes like this. The greatest challenge equals the greatest accomplishment, which equals the greatest bestowal of good. Want to see how that links up? Is this thing on? So all of us are gifted to choose our own path in life, to attain the heights of human perfection, or to plummet to the depths of depravity. The question is like this, what are the dynamics of free will? Is everything we do, say, think, all completely free? Find out next time.